I'm going to introduce ReTV. I just changed the slide again. I trust the slide also changed for you and then I know that everything is working perfectly. Um, so the ReTV project is a European Union funded project and we're heavily involved in this whole area of data and television. That's why we're also so interested in, in promoting uh, research and, and innovation in, in data and TV and finding out also what others are doing in this space because we also are asking uh, the same questions with all this uh, data being created uh, online and in inside industries. Uh, how can this data actually be of more value to the, the media industry? And our project already has been running several years and, and already years before this when we were writing the proposal, so the idea to get funding for the project, we were already writing about the fact that viewing of the linear broadcast TV was decreasing uh, and people were spending more and more time on, on digital content, uh, especially non-linear, so things like catch-up TV, over the top, uh, and also actually video via social networks. And I mean, in the, in the years since, um, you know, this trend just continues um, and now with the coronavirus, I mean, there were lots of statistics this year already very interesting about uh, the effect on the digital landscape as people were staying more at home. So a lot of these uh, online media providers were making, of course, great gains in terms of the amount of time people were spending with online media services and also the number of people subscribing to these services. So especially for, let's say, the traditional media industry, the broadcasters, their audience is becoming much and more fragmented across all these different channels now. So it's not just about viewing television on the television set uh, on, a, on a linear channel. No, it's uh, uh, the content might just as easily be consumed via social media or, or even um, uh, on YouTube, you know, whether uh, the rights were acquired or not. Um, and the TV industry is still trying to catch up to a certain extent. I mean, as always, different broadcasters at different stages in terms of this. Um, uh, the BBC, I, I should mention, in the United Kingdom has been very uh, very present, at least uh, in my view, in the last year, has been very present in this whole area of, of creating and using data. Um, so you see how some broadcasters are, are moving more quickly than others. Um, but in, in general, there's still, I think, a lot of uh, opportunity there in terms of using um, <clears throat> innovative technologies combined with data to, to help broadcasters do a better job of um, being able to personalize. So for example, as, as Sarah was saying, with personalization of content, um, tracking and targeting, not now in a, let's say, a, a data privacy um, challenging way, but in terms of basically gaining more insights with their audiences, being able to also know what type of content uh, they should promote to, to which audience on, on which channel at what time. So not necessarily at the individual level of identifying and, and tracking people, but having um, more insights, more analytics available to them about uh, their audiences and, and with what content they can best reach and engage with those audiences. So in, in, a, in the short time that I have, um, I can give you a brief overview of two of the um, end user tools. Uh, end user in the sense now of the media industry rather than the, the TV viewer, the, the consumer. Um, we have one called the Topic Compass. Uh, and this is about identifying future topics of interest to the audience. Uh, because one of the things we, we, we've learned in, in this project has been, uh, at least with our uh, use case partners, is, is how the broadcasters, of course, plan uh, for future promotion of their media assets. Um, and of course, the limitations they have currently in terms of knowing what is the best uh, topic to publish about, so what promote some content they have on that topic uh, in the future. So they have basically prediction. Um, and we need a tool that actually, when they know what topic they want to publish about, actually helps them prepare and, and make the publication on whatever digital channel they want, uh, say social media. So that's the content wizard. Um, and on the right hand side, you see a little bit uh, sort of a high level illustration of the, the whole sort of data driven cycle that we have in place. Um, so we can actually collect a lot of data from different channels. We're monitoring the web, we're monitoring social media, 
and we're using the, this monitoring to uh, annotate the content that's online and extract from it uh, the topics of interest and the trends over time, which of course feeds into the prediction uh, part of this cycle. <clears throat> um, the enhancement is uh, also based on what topics are of interest, so enhancement in terms of preparing the media asset to be appropriate for publication on the channel. So a typical case here is summarization. So on social media, you want to promote uh, an entire TV program using a much shorter video, like highlights um, <clears throat> to promote. Then scheduling, so what is the best day and time to actually publish now this uh, summarized video and promote the content. Uh, and through measuring the success of the publication, of course, we get this uh, cycle, learning cycle in a sense, so that the more that we collect data, the more we analyze the publications that are made, of course, the more, the, the more data leads to even better analytics. So I'll introduce those two tools very briefly to you. Um, and everything else, of course, you can ask about um, through the Q&A. So the Topics Compass is all about what are the trending topics. And prediction is, is clearly a, you know, a, a challenging area. And it's interesting to note that most monitoring tools tend to focus on giving you analytics of the data up to the present moment, rather than trying to predict to you how the data will look tomorrow or, or next week. So this is the, the dashboard now in, let's say, the classical monitoring um, uh, function where we see the past data. So uh, a lot of information here, but you can see the date range. So this was the, the last week of March. This year, we were tracking different cultural heritage topics for our <clears throat> partner, the Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision. Um, and you see there's a, a burst in frequency um, of documents from the web related to cultural heritage uh, around starting on the 30th of March. Uh, you see here top associations, which basically the, the keywords in the documents aggregated. So what were the most common keywords in this document collection? We see Van Gogh and um, museum director Vincent Van, okay, so Vincent Van Gogh. Um, Lauren is actually the name of the museum director. And if we look at the documents themselves, we, we see very quickly that there's a, there was a theft of a Vincent van Gogh painting in the Dutch Museum, which led to this, um, let's say, peak in frequency. So looking into the past, we can already identify, uh, of course, uh, when a certain topic has, um, has a particular focus, let's say, uh, in terms of there being online discussion, online uh, content about it, and what exactly was the, the content. But to turn this into the future, uh, as I said, we need to monitor online web pages. So we, we monitor news articles, also content on broadcasters' websites, also social media accounts. We also collect EPG data through one of our partners uh, and also related content. So posts by anybody on social media mentioning any of the TV programs we're tracking. And, and we get this sort of all this into a repository, you know. So here, I mean, here you can see EPG data at the top left. On the right-hand side, it's um, social media about um, a German children's TV program called Sandmenschen. So again, a link to Sarah's talk with, with you know, children's content. So Sandmenschen, who I was thinking would also be nice to be able to superimpose the, the, the child viewer's hat onto the Sandmenschen character while they're watching. That would be probably quite uh, exciting for the child watching, watching the TV show. And for each document, this is a, now at the bottom of a web page. As I say, this is what Monitoring Game of Thrones mentions. Uh, we extract keywords. So here we, we get the keywords of Dubrovnik and Croatian. So we could pick up maybe on this link that exists between the, the Croatian town of Dubrovnik and Game of Thrones. Um, with all this data that we collect, we've been experimenting with predictive analytics and actually in, in a number of different ways. So not a single approach, but a combination of approaches. First one actually we created a, a knowledge base of events. Um, so here, of course, we can highlight events that are going to happen um, in the future as much as in the past that we have in our knowledge base. We also looked at extracting date references from the documents. So in, uh, when I extracted this screenshot, it was still 
uh, April, but I could already see things that are uh, discussed uh, to be happening on the 25th of July, such as the Christopher Street Day in Berlin, um, the Sonne Mannheims, a German music group. Probably all of this is not any, any more relevant thanks to uh, the pandemic, but this is what the, the web was uh, uh, talking about for regarding this future date. Um, and basically predictive analytics, so extrapolating the, the, the past trends in the data into the future. So um, uh, on the left hand side, you actually see, again, based on the temporal reference detection, uh, we're here, the world is looking at uh, discussion with airports in the context of Berlin. Our other use case partner is the Berlin and Brandenburg uh, broadcaster RBB. And you can see the, here a big peak at the end of October. Uh, so it was detected that on 31st of October, there was a significant amount of documents. Uh, sorry, there was a significant amount of documents that were already talking about Berlin airports in the context of the future date of the 31st of October. And for anyone who uh, knows about this, so this is of course the date that the new Berlin airport is uh, scheduled to open, hopefully after I think uh, seven years of delay or whatever uh, it was. Um, on the right hand side, we have a, a similar uh, future prediction for cultural heritage. So basically, we have a list of terms that uh, we've defined for cultural heritage events, so things like you know concerts and festivals and whatever. Uh, and if we look at this uh, future trend chart, then of course we can see where there are peaks. And we can also then look at well, what documents are associated with uh, that topic on that future date. So in this case, we have a peak here towards um, I guess it's the middle of October. Um, so if we look at what's uh, talked about to be happening in the middle of October, we find out that the Coachella Festival in the US, which is one of the big uh, music festivals, has been uh, postponed and is planned, who knows, but is planned to take place now in, in these dates in the middle of October. So for example, somebody who wanted, you know, they have a, also have archives. If they want to promote content about cultural heritage, and they want to plan what content they want to highlight on a future date, then for example, here they could say, oh, okay, you know, early to mid October, we could be publishing stuff related to uh, Coachella, maybe to the music acts that are due to play there uh, that we have in our archive, because at, we know at this time, um, Coachella will be a, a, a rising topic of interest to our audience. Um, so assuming that the uh, organization uh, uses this this predictive capability and is able to say okay next week next month or maybe even months into the future um this is the topic i want to publish on on, on that date um they need of course to find some uh, content in their in their archive in or in their media asset uh collection that's related to that topic and prepare it for the for the publication so i mean it's very typical in, in organizations to already schedule in advance future publications. Um, so we have a tool also in the project uh, from a, a company called Livuro. So the, the tool exists as a uh, standard social media um, marketing tool right now. So you can already get it actually and use it to schedule future social media posts. But of course, it doesn't have any of this um, innovation uh, inside it that we're developing in the VTV project. So part of our uh, future exploitation in ReTV will be to uh, to make this um, available through the this commercial tool um, uh, to organizations that are interested. So the, the, the tool is being extended in, in different ways based on the technologies that we are developing now in, in ReTV. So of course the starting point would be the search within the media asset collection for a, a suitable video. I mean, we've been using a lot of archive video because of rights. So actually the example you see here um, was taken from, from our, our media archive. So the kitchen of the future, at least the, what they thought it would be in the 1950s, how the future would look. Um, we're building also here um, a neural network based uh, video search capabilities with our, our partner SIRTH in Greece. Uh, they're actually generating um, uh, embedding layers which uh, provide a sort of a signature um, in terms of a vector for video 
uh, content. And then, of course, once you have um, uh, an associated also with uh, terms, textual terms in the same embedding layer, and it basically will allow you to make a text search and they can automatically find videos that best match that text search, i.e. the videos whose uh, uh, signatures in this embedding layer are closest to the, to the terms. Um, so quite advanced um, AI technology. Um, so we could take the topic that was, let's say, identified or predicted in the previous step and use it to find a matching video, even the video itself does not have matching textual metadata. Um, it would be based purely on the uh, visual features of the video itself. Um, and we're also going to embed into the content wizard this whole prediction capability. So what you saw previously with this uh, dashboard, rather than using the full dashboard, if it's um, not uh, needed is you would be able to access actually the predictive uh, visualizations um, within the content wizard tool. So this is again another visualization which is called the story graph. So it actually predicts, well, yeah, it, it predicts based on um, these temporal references uh, stories into the future basically. You know? um, and stories are defined as a, a group of our cluster of keywords um, that co-occur uh, related to that future date. Um, once the video is selected, as I mentioned before, a video tends to need some sort of further preparation before it can be published on channels like social media. So again, the current uh, Livuro Engage tool already has what you see here on the slide. So you can select for the social network um, the right uh, aspect ratio uh, for the video. So in this case, I mean, if it's an Instagram story, for example, you need a nine to 16 ratio. So here you would need to, to select within the video uh, using a bounding box uh, where, where the, <clears throat> what should be focused on. So basically it would be cut to, to this part. So you might want to remove what you know is, is less relevant to the viewer and make sure that the focus in the Instagram story version of the video is on, the, on what the, the viewer of course should be seeing, so be able to see. And we've extended this as well uh, with a, a more complete summarization uh, capability, again, thanks to our partners in Greece, CERTH. Um, so you can, depending on the social network you want to target, the summarization uh, service will also uh, pre-select uh, an optimal length of the video. And then based on that length, um, and also on another uh, characteristic called rhythm, which is basically how quickly uh, the, the shots change. So, I mean, in some cases, things like stories, for example, it, it can be actually quite feasible to have a very short duration video that actually changes very quickly. Um, while if you have a longer video, maybe on, you know, embedded on, on the Facebook uh, wall, uh, you might actually want a slower rhythm. Um, and then from these um, pre, uh, pre settings, uh, the summarization service would pick out the uh, shots or the sub shots from the video that are the most relevant to form a summary of the video. So they would still capture the core information of the video in inside the shorter duration. Um, finally, of course, you need to know when is the best time to then actually publish this onto the channel. Um, again, we want to use uh, the audience uh, insights that we have. Um, so for example, here you can look at when other higher levels of engagement with the, the, the organization's social media channel, right? So one of the times where it just happens to be more, more likes taking place or, or other engagement actions uh, or more views on, on the content that's been published like videos. Um, so when is the audience most active? You know? and, and following this to decide, okay, probably a post, to just give, make an example, a post that goes out on Friday 6 p.m. might be likely to have more engagement than a post that was sent out on Thursday at 5 a.m. You know? um, so the tool actually pro, uh, propose an optimal publication time, depending on the channel. Um, and we're also working on a text summarization, which basically means not only the video could be summarized, but based on maybe a longer text, 
um, that the, the organization has. It could be the description of the video, it could be something else. Maybe the person would take something from a, a different article, uh, let's say a news story, if it, the video was related to a news story. Um, and then we would actually have um, a tool in, uh, integrated into the content wizard, which would automatically summarize this text to a, a length which is suitable for the social media channel. So, I mean, we all know Twitter. Uh, now I'm gonna get this wrong, aren't I? So I think, it wasn't it 80 characters and now 160, or was it more than this? Somebody correct me in the Q&A box. Um, but, you know, Twitter has this uh, fixed length. Um, and while even in Facebook, you can of course write much more in a post, we know that there's probably an optimal length uh, for the posts that people will still read. You're not going to post an entire essay. Uh, not many of your followers will probably want to read all of it. Um, so the text will also have a, an automatic summarization button. Um, and again, similar to the video, uh, we use the um, analytics we have on different keywords to say, okay, we want to focus the text on sentences that contain the, the most popular keywords because we believe that th that's going to be the most interesting uh, content for the reader. Okay, I know I'm over 20 minutes, but um, uh, thankfully we're still very well on time in this webinar. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're interested in the topics compass of the content wizard, um, besides asking questions now, uh, you can find more demos, of course, on the ReTV uh, website. Um, you can also sign up for our newsletter and then every few months, not too often, you won't, be get, you won't get spammed. Um, you, you'll get an email with a summary of all the latest uh, news from the project. And if you're really, really interested and you want to get some real hands-on experience with these tools, while they're still inside a research project, still a little bit experimental and still opportunities for feedback and for um, ideas, uh, we also have something called the Stakeholder Forum. And there you actually get, will get like beta access uh, to these tools to uh, t uh, test them, um, give feedback, and especially if you want to maybe uh, guide uh, what we do with them and, and, and you want to help ensure that maybe at the end it's potentially a tool that you might actually want to actually use in your organization, then of course this is a good opportunity to get involved now. And you'll, you'll find again on our website the form to um, request to be a member of our stakeholder forum. Okay, I think I can go now to the webcam. I thank you very much uh, for your attention and um, look forward to uh, any questions you have. Thanks very much, Lyndon. That's, uh, that's great. Um, so while we're waiting for, the, for questions, um, are we confident th this question answer box actually is working? There's no questions there at the moment. Um, if, if, if not, then um, perhaps um, we can just open, Rasser, if you can open up the, um, um, allow everybody to, to jump in if they want. But first question that's getting me there, Lyndon, was um, uh, within the project, how uh, confident are you? Are, is there any evaluation on, on checking uh, the relevance of, 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 the, uh, of the clips selected? You know, uh, say is you know you, you're looking for relevant clips how, how, mm -hmm. how do you check how do you evaluate um what what uh, uh, how good a job it's doing in selecting that uh, those, those okay so i mean uh, as you you know i talked about different technologies there so there's different things that we can evaluate in fact so for example the video summarization which is means that you've already selected a longer video and then you want to create a shorter one. We have, there you even have some, something that you could consider like a like sort of ground truth corpus to, to make your evaluations with. Um, of course, in all this area, and this is why I think it's a very good question, when it comes to prediction or recommendation, there's always a question, well, how do I evaluate really the, uh, if this works or not? So, I mean, we, we want to run now in a, the final phase of the project, we want to run uh, a couple of social media accounts where the publications will actually be guided by these tools. And I mean, it hopefully not too naive, but we, we would of course then look at, okay, do we maybe in this period, see more reach or more engagement with the content, with the posts, uh, than, than has been previously the case on those accounts. Because uh, hopefully that can then at least be an indicator that our tools are indeed uh, suggesting uh, topics um, 
that will be will, that do lead to to more engagement or reach with the audience. I mean, we have we have the basic evaluation. So I mean, you, in prediction, you of course say, well, we know of course some um, topics that will be important into the future. So now let's plug in those future dates and see if we get the same topic automatically through the system. Um, and, and then we go, okay, well then you know, prediction's working. But on, on many days, of course, it's um, uh, it's not as obvious as this. Um, so as I say, there is always the, the, qual the quantitative evaluations you can do. You can take uh, some sort of ground truth corpus, even create one yourself with, with annotators and then test the, um, the results. But in the, let's say the real world where you would say, okay, now let's, spend a month uh, choosing topics based on these tools. The problem is, of course, you, you can't really compare it to, well, if I had published at that moment something else, how would it have been different? No, because you can't have these two parallel universes in place. Um, but we do, we do want to see if maybe over a period of time using these tools with a social media account that we can at least increase the average reach or average engagement of the content that they publish compared to the previously. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, are there any, any other questions? Can I see one from Sarah, or maybe that those that those what you're asking, right, Jeremy? Um, or is it it's a slightly different question, so I can answer it as well. So Sarah I, I asks what one, kind. But, um, but, but yeah, you, uh, if you see one, then you go for it. Yeah. <laughs> So Sarah was asking what kinds of user tests we already want or we plan to to do in the future. So, of course, in the project, as I said before, a lot of the testing up to now has been more internal, like qualit uh, quantitative. Um, but of course, we need these sort of qualitative tests as well, where we actually get uh, stakeholders on board with us. Um, we've already had one workshop with some of the stakeholders. So these are like external media organizations, not organizations within the consortium of the project. Um, we've had user testing in the sense of giving them these tools and getting feedback on, on usability, uh, interface design and so on. So the things that Sarah also works in. Um, so what's still missing, and this is the, the final phase now that we'll have uh, early 2021 all being well, is, is as I say, that we actually do tests where um, we will have a number of organizations involved. It's not... But those those of the people listening who work in similar areas, you probably know this. It's not that easy to get, uh, you know, a number of staff members in some external organization to spend some time with your uh, experimental tool, and uh, especially to encourage them to actually publish their real social media content with it. Um, so thankfully, we've got a, a couple of interested organizations who, who, who are, are prepared to, to work with us. And we're always happy to hear about more of them, um, where we, we would actually have those tools being used within the, let's say, the real world uh, social media marketing um, processes um, and, and evaluating then not only the, the tool usage itself in a sense. So for example, do they find it now uh, easier to select topics and to create social media posts, but also uh, hopefully see if um, the posts that our tools are suggesting to them uh, are more successful in a marketing sense uh, than, than uh, the previous content. Okay, uh, I, I have another question here from uh, Philo van Kimenade. Okay. Uh, can you see that, uh, Lyndon? Uh, I'll, I'll read that. I uh, should Lyndon? be able to see it, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks for the great presentation. He's right there. Uh, how you. tightly coupled are the predictive analyti uh, analytics components to the media authoring components? Can they be easily swapped based on the user needs? Okay, yeah, thank you for the question, Philo. Um, I'm, asking, I'm thinking a bit now what do you mean by coupling? So, in a sense, they're not, they're not, they're not tightly coupled. That's the easy way to answer it because. Um, they are eff effectively separate media web services uh, that are that are uh, providing these different functionalities. Um, of course, the intention is that the output of the predictive analytics component can be an input to the media authoring component. That's clear, but they're certainly not tightly coupled. I mean, you could use one without the other, for example. So I guess that's what you mean when you say easily swapped. I mean, you could if if you had an alternative media auth authoring. I mean the 
the output for the predictive analytics would be, for example, a, a, a set of keywords that are predicted to be of particular interest for that the future date that you've provided. So as long as the media authoring component can take that as an input, then you could also use a different media authoring component or, or vice versa. Okay, thanks. So, okay, if there's no more questions. Uh, oh, um, okay, Florian, mm. uh, how market ready is, uh, is this? Yeah, another good question. So, um, obviously it's not yet. Uh, market ready. However, we're happy to have this um, collaboration with uh, Levuro and the Levuro tool is already a commercial tool. And I, I think, I mean, some of the, the audience here probably also have experience with European projects. So we know that one of the challenges that we often have in the research field is we can do lots of very exciting uh, implementations or innovations, but then we, we need still somehow to um, fill in all the other gaps that exist to, to be able to have a commercial uh, product as a result. So things like the interface, stabi stability, you know, scalability. Um, so both of the tools I showed you are extensions of existing commercial tools. So in that sense, if the extensions themselves are, um, are demonstrably useful, in terms of meeting the needs of the, the, the user, then they would be market ready. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks very much, Linda. Yeah. Thank you very much.